Ace Attorney is a franchise that I've been sleeping on for a very, very long time, at least in terms of video games. It's been almost 20 years since the original game released on GBA. I'm only 24 years old! Ugh. I actually wanted to be a lawyer when I was much younger, had a much different view of the world back then, and I was obsessed with GBA games, so I'm not sure how it almost entirely passed me by, but here we are. I did at some point play through a good chunk of the second game, but it was so long ago that I really don't remember anything about it. I've always thought that it would be something I'd at least kind of enjoy, but something else always seemed to take priority. And let me just say that I am so sorry for waiting so long because I immediately fell in love with this franchise. The silver lining of waiting so long is that now I have a bunch of games to make my way through that I've been told are mostly of the same quality as this one, if not better. At this point, I've played through the second and third game as well, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm really excited to see the entire series. It's even kind of gotten me looking at other visual novel-ish games as well, which is a genre that I've not paid too much attention to ever, really. All the evidence I've gathered points to a simple fact. I'm really gonna like making my way through this franchise. I'm Callus, and I really recommend Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. For the sake of convenience in recording and the substantial and excellent additional piece of content, I played the version of this game on the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney collection on PC specifically. While I do adore sprite art, and that's unfortunately not preserved in this version of the game, I do understand the choice of changing the art style to something that adapts to differing resolutions more easily, and I did come to appreciate the new art style, though it would have been nice if there was an option to use the original art style in the collection at least in the returning cases. Mega Man did it, why not this? I found Ace Attorney to be a wholly unique experience. Yes, there's a bit of visual novel, yes, there's a bit of puzzle game, but the specific combination and execution of every aspect that makes up Ace Attorney creates a unique flavor that I've never experienced elsewhere. Even Danganronpa's gameplay loop and flow doesn't feel quite the same, though that's probably the closest thing that I'm particularly familiar with. I'm sure there's other stuff out there, but I only know what I know. I always treasure truly unique gameplay experiences. I love video games as a medium, and when they do something unique and interesting, it's exciting even if it doesn't always appeal to me specifically, but in this case, it definitely does, so yay for me. Ace Attorney is unquestionably a story-driven experience. But the way that the gameplay perfectly weaves into that narrative, each aspect complementing and building upon each other, is both what makes Ace Attorney unique and is, in my opinion, a large part of what makes it fun. The nature of the gameplay means that, even if you have a few spoilers for things that take place, the narrative will still be engaging moment to moment. The game straight up tells you who committed some of the murders ahead of time, and that doesn't make it any less enjoyable to unravel the mystery of what happened and prove it beyond any reasonable doubt. My point is, if you've happened to get spoilers for Ace Attorney, that is unfortunate, but you should still be able to enjoy the games despite that. Also, in this video, I'm going to be talking about the premise of the main story and the premise of Phoenix's character arc. If you want to go in completely 100% blind, consider skipping this video. I don't know why you'd be watching a video like this about something that you wanted to go in blind on, but yeah, there's that warning. In order for my commentary and evaluations to be valuable, I need to address some things that happen early on. I'm really only going to go into detail on the tutorial case and the introduction of the first proper case, and even with that said, I'm not going to spoil the end of the tutorial case. If you were to have any hope of progressing through these games without a guide, from the name of the game and the footage I've shown thus far, you've probably put together that you play as Phoenix Wright in this game. However, he's not 
quite an ace attorney, at least not yet. He's a defense lawyer who, in the tutorial of the game, takes on his very first case. He's an apprentice under another defense attorney, Mia Fey. While most cases involve investigating and gathering facts before entering into the proper trial, the tutorial doesn't do this for reasons that I think very much improve the first time player experience and will become evident throughout the trial. Uh, video throughout the video. I'll explain them later is what I'm saying. Thankfully, the tutorial doesn't just throw you in completely unprepared. It does give you at least a bit of information and context before the trial starts. Your client is Larry Butts, a childhood friend of Phoenix. He's a bit of a deadbeat and a crybaby who sometimes has difficulty taking things seriously, but generally speaking, his heart's in the right place. He's been accused of murdering his girlfriend, and Phoenix very much believes that Larry, despite his numerous flaws, is not a murderer and he intends to prove it in the first case that he's ever led the defense on, so no pressure for you, the player. Mia's there to give him pointers, explain court proceedings, and be on his side, but not to make his arguments for him. Most of the tutorializing will come from the very lovely Miss Faye. Look, she's pretty and confident, and I'm so very gay. So as for the actual trial, we meet the judge, a rather important character, considering there are no juries in these trials. The judge and his gavel rule on the guilt or innocence of our defendant. See, this is a game from Japan, and it was originally constructed in no small part as a criticism of the rather fucked Japanese legal system. The system has since changed at least a bit, but from an outsider looking in, it still seems pretty fucked. Court proceedings then and now heavily favor the prosecution in Japan. Japan, and so for our intrepid defense attorney, these various cases will absolutely be an uphill battle. To add on to that stress, there's a conceit in the game that no trial can take more than three days, which means that you're always operating under a ticking clock to ensure that your client continues to be both free and alive. Again, no pressure. The prosecutor for this case, and thus the person arguing against you and your client, is one win Winston Payne, the rookie killer. An old man apparently notorious for taking down rookie defense attorneys. He puts up a strong front, but once flaws are pointed out in his arguments, he tends to fold pretty quickly. This is just the tutorial after all. The real challenge is coming later. The general flow of a trial is that someone will be called to testify, a specialist, witness, or someone who can provide context for some piece of evidence. Generally, the witness will be called by the prosecution as part of their argument against your client. Client. After they testify, that is, explain the information they have, Phoenix will be given the opportunity to cross-examine them, and here's where the gameplay comes into play. Your goal during these cross-examinations is to search for contradictions, thus weakening the prosecution's argument. Your only weapons are your wits, the evidence tucked away in the court record, and the truth. At pretty much any point in the game, you can examine the court record to review all of the evidence you've either acquired or that was submitted by the prosecution, as well as look at the profiles of everyone involved in the case. With this evidence, you can point out contradictions as you go through the testimony line by line. You can also press each line of dialogue for further context, information, or clarification from the person testifying. Either by pressing or presenting evidence, you poke holes in the prosecution's testimony Testimony, forcing their witnesses to testify again to explain contradictions over and over until the truth of the matter comes to light, and that's the winding and often very strange road we take to justice. However, it's not usually quite so simple. If you try to point out contradictions where none exist or pursue argumentative lines that are just a waste of the court's time, the judge may very well penalize you. This is your health for the game. Get penalized enough times and it's game over. Particularly tense moments may increase the severity of the penalty, meaning you can make fewer mistakes or maybe make no mistakes at all. Paranoid gamer that I am, I saved repeatedly during each and every cross-examination, even when I still had completely full health. 
I also obsessively pressed on every line of testimony that I could before presenting evidence to point out a contradiction, both so I could gather more information and so I could see as much of that amazingly written dialogue as possible. The prosecution is also present, of course, and will argue against you, holding your feet to the fire, forcing you to provide evidence or reasoning that proves something as fact, rather than just raising it as a possibility or pointing out contradictions of their own in whatever theory the defense is constructing to get an innocent verdict. The court record can serve them just as much as it serves you. The dramatic back and forth argument is always exhilarating to take part in and the entire trial gameplay loop just made me feel clever. It demands that you not only figure out what happened, but provide the logic and evidence behind every single step of it. Sometimes it's not just presenting a specific piece of evidence. You may have to point out why it's important from a list of options if the prosecution tries to grill you on it, or if you say present a photograph, you may have to point out which part of that photograph provides the contradiction. For a more concrete and rather straightforward example, in the tutorial case, a witness claims that he saw the victim dead after our client fled the crime scene, specifically at 1 p.m. But see, this is a bit odd because the autopsy report states that the victim died at some point between 4 and 5 p.m. Unless that autopsy report can be proven false somehow, this leaves three possibilities. One, when the witness saw the victim, she wasn't dead. Two, for some reason, the witness was mistaken about the time. Three, the witness is lying or some combination of those possibilities, of course. The judge asks why he was so certain he discovered the body at 1 p.m., so the witness testifies to attempt to explain away this contradiction. And now we need to find another contradiction within that explanation. The rhythm of testimony to cross-examination to argument to testimony and on and on is a gameplay loop that I always found satisfying and am right now in this very moment both while writing and reading out this script craving more of it's fucking great it's so good right it's really good like there i i can't i never get tired of it like even even in turnabout big top mm -hmm. even in the worst case in the series probably it, it still just feels so good to like just get in there and like point out uh, like think about everything that's presented to you and like fucking mind palace it all together it's it's fun it's really 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 fun fuck i love ace attorney fuck i might leave some of this in <laughs> hi it's six in the morning right now, and I'm very tired. <laughs> Woo! Ace Attorney absolutely nails storytelling and presentation despite possible technical limitations. There's a common sentiment that limitations can breed creativity, but they can also, of course, be creatively limiting. Ace Attorney was originally a Game Boy Advance game, and yet it never felt lacking in impact in any meaningful way. The animations, character designs, sound effects, music, gameplay, writing, and just a touch of voice acting all work together perfectly to deliver a suspenseful, inventive, and compelling experience that I absolutely adored beginning to end, and we aren't even past the tutorial yet! Just to be extra sure, this is where I'm going to be talking about what happens at the beginning of the second case. What I'm going to talk about, I'm sure a lot of people will consider spoilers, but I can't really talk about this game or series in any detail without going into it, and it's literally the first thing that happens after the tutorial, so... At the beginning of the second case, we're met with a black screen. Mia is having a conversation on the phone with her sister, Maya. Mia is asking Maya to hold on to some evidence for an upcoming trial. She'll come by at nine to pick up a clock of some kind that's made to look like the thinker. That doesn't really function as a clock anymore and is now filled with papers. Weird, but that's just part of the Ace Attorney charm. They're going to go out for burgers because Maya likes burgers. And I'm sure it's a good opportunity for the Faye sisters to catch up. 
Next, we see the room that leads into Mia's office, as Mia has a not-so-friendly conversation with someone. This person steals the clock with the papers inside, and then, well... At 9.08 p.m., Phoenix arrives at the office, a bit late. He was invited to go out for dinner, too. He very quickly notices the smell of blood, and upon heading into Mia's office proper, sees who will come to know as Maya, crying over Mia's still warm body. Maya faints, and Phoenix leaves her lying on a couch while he investigates what happened. After some poking around, a woman in a nearby hotel calls the police. Phoenix has some time to talk to Maya and try to gather more information before police arrive. When they do arrive, they jump to the conclusion that Maya must be the killer because Mia left a message in her own blood with Maya's name on it. And they arrest her. At the detention center, Phoenix wants to help Maya and find out the truth. Mia was his mentor and friend after all. But Maya turns down his offer to defend her. Apparently, Mia had claimed that he was lacking in experience. Maya instead asks you to track down a defense attorney that her sister recommended. Through the course of the conversation, we also learn that the Fays are a family with strong mystical power. Specifically, their spirit mediums, which would be why Maya is dressed like that. Mia apparently chose to leave that life behind to become a lawyer. I won't go into every single detail, but Phoenix continues investigating, and Grossberg, the lawyer who Mia recommended, refuses to take the case for some reason. Which of course means Phoenix takes the case himself. He no longer has Mia to rely on, he has to figure things out for himself, there's an innocent girl to defend, and he has a deeply personal stake in finding out the truth. Also, I really cared about the narrative at this point, too. It's a really good hook for a second case. At this point, it becomes rather clear that gameplay variety comes in the fact that each case is split into trial and investigation sections. Most cases will have three of each. There's that three-day trial limit coming into play. It flows really well and allows for a natural breakpoint from the high tension and energy of the trials into something that's usually more relaxed and slow lower paced in the investigation. The investigation sections are, of course, about gathering information, going to different places, looking for clues, talking to people. It's a fairly simple process, but it works, and there's enough freedom in the order of how you go about things that I found it engaging from a gameplay perspective. These sections are played from Phoenix's perspective, sort of first person. The locations you go to are represented by a drawn background. Sometimes these backgrounds are large enough that you can slide over to reveal more. You can click on things in these backgrounds to have Phoenix and possibly any other character who is around comment on them. Sometimes these are just cute little jokes or observations, other times this may lead to new information or even clues to put into the court record. The other major thing is that you can talk to people, which has two aspects. You can just select a subject of some kind to question them on, or you can present the evidence in the court record to them to gain more information, context, or possibly even more new clues. This information can either help further your investigation or become something more directly relevant to the trial section. The general structure of the investigation sequences is more open than that of the trials. After an investigation sequence begins, you typically have multiple places you can go or NPCs to talk to at any given time. It is overall linear. You have to collect all of the evidence and see certain scenes to progress, but it feels organic and ensures that most of the time, wherever you go, you'll be encountering new information or scenes. I, of course, scraped against the walls of what I could find, examining every single thing in the background and presenting every single piece of evidence to every single NPC, which was fun to me at least, scratched that completionist itch. But all of those points eventually converge to a climax of some kind, at which point the investigation opens up with multiple options again, or you proceed to the trial. 
Mechanically, the trial section is the same as the tutorial, but there are two rather major differences in content and context. One, Mia isn't here to guide your actions, and two, instead of the relative pushover prosecutor pain, we're going up against prosecutor Miles Edgeworth. He's an ace prosecutor who has never lost a case. He's well-informed, dangerously charismatic, and diabolically clever. Edgeworth and Phoenix also seem to know each other somehow. The flavor provided by the addition of Edgeworth is top notch. All of the writing and characterization around him is compelling, and you can tangibly feel the difference in gameplay as well. There are times where he'll purposefully lay traps in his witnesses' testimonies, wait to provide evidence that he knows contradicts what you have until you bring it to the court's attention, or sit back and let you make a large and elaborate argument only to turn it around on Phoenix right at the end to make his client actually look more guilty. He's far more persistent and convincing in arguments as well, which makes those back and forths more engaging and dramatic. Do not expect to make any significant or meaningful progress in court against Edgeworth without absolutely earning every single step of it. Playing through these arguments between Phoenix and Edgeworth was another thing that I really couldn't get in any other piece of fiction. It was a type of tension I've never quite experienced before and cannot get enough of. The challenge of these moments makes it really satisfying to break Edgeworth's smug, composed veneer by finally proving him wrong on something. I also found these moments very humanizing, and they allowed him to not feel out of place in a setting with a lot of weirdos while still getting to be a character who is very serious. Pain was a pushover because that was the tutorial, and we are not in the fucking tutorial anymore. On that note, the tutorial only having the court section was a clever design decision as far as I'm concerned, because it allowed me to focus on learning the court aspect of the gameplay. Then when the other cases happened, I felt like I understood how I should be looking at, evaluating, and putting together information and evidence from the investigation sequences. If it had opened on an extended investigation sequence, I definitely could have seen myself getting lost in information overload without enough context for what that information was supposed to be used for. Whereas when the first actual investigation started, I found myself immediately looking for contradictions or how different pieces of evidence connected to each other, forming theories and trying to predict potential arguments and counterarguments. So I was having fun with the tutorial, but it was overall a very goofy and fairly lighthearted experience, you know, aside from the murder. But this case is much heavier. It gripped me immediately. And while it's still absolutely willing to have jokes and bizarre things happen fairly often, there's a very grounded emotional core to the writing here. The tutorial had aspects of this as well, but the second case is what made me realize that Ace Attorney is willing to delve into complex and heart-wrenching topics without just turning them into jokes. And it handles those topics with sensitivity, skill, and what felt to me like genuine heart. I found myself caring deeply for the main characters in the story, and as I've mentioned, every aspect of this game perfectly builds on all of the others. Having that emotional stake in the story made desperately crawling towards the truth in court more compelling, and wringing out every bit of information in both the investigations and cross-examinations made me care even more about the characters. I'm kind of in awe of how impeccable the core design of this franchise is. Everything about it just works so well. It's genuinely incredible. If I had to point to the strongest single aspect of the franchise, it would probably be the main characters. All of them are amazingly well-written, complex, likable, and interesting. I fucking adore them. There's Phoenix, who can absolutely present a confident and charismatic front in court, or when someone he cares about is in emotional distress, but he seems to be in a constant state of internal panic that does occasionally slip to the surface. This dichotomy is painfully relatable for me. His story of proving himself and stepping into his own as a lawyer by having to go up against an incredibly skilled and accomplished prosecutor in Edgeworth in a legal system that's stacked against him while also dealing with the loss of his mentor and friend Mia is a very moving narrative, and seeing him grow throughout that journey into a proper ace attorney is is downright compelling. Also, he can be very sassy and sarcastic, which is just fun to see. 
Then there's Maya, who continues to have a role after the second case as Phoenix's, or as she calls him, Nick's assistant. Most investigation sections are spent with her and she'll usually be someone to consult during a trial. Not that she has particularly professional legal advice, but she can provide a very different perspective. I'd say that she's more short-sighted than Nick, but generally speaking, more emotionally mature, or at least more in touch with and willing to express her emotions. She's absolutely an insane weirdo goofball with strange off-the-wall takes and a very unique view of the world, but she only rarely holds anything back, usually stuff having to do with Mia or other Faye stuff. Whereas Phoenix seems to be constantly holding back a full-on breakdown. The fact that she's a spirit medium in training also does a lot to give her that different, sometimes insightful perspective from Phoenix. She is obviously dealing with the loss of her sister throughout this game, and she forms a fast and strong friendship with Phoenix. It strikes me as a very natural and wholesome example of a found family narrative. They very much come off as siblings, and their banter and bickering is a constantly delightful source of wholesome and hilarious joy. When things get serious, they absolutely have each other's backs and they both knew a different side of Mia and can share that with each other. Their arcs are about supporting each other as they mourn the loss of Mia and each grow into their own. Phoenix as an attorney and Maya as a spirit medium. I care a lot about them, okay? I already broke down a lot of Edgeworth's character, but his arc throughout the game I personally found to be the most engaging and interesting of the entire cast. For reasons I cannot at all talk about without basically spoiling the entire game, so I'm not gonna do that. But I am going to say that every single argument between Edgeworth and Phoenix is fucking S tier to both read and play. There's also Detective Dick Gumshoe, who's a bit less important to the narrative than the other main characters, but he does have a consistently recurring, charmingly earnest, if not entirely competent, role in both the investigations and trials. He's a good boy who's always trying his best, and he he really deserves a raise. Come on. It's so mean. Like it starts as like a funny joke, but then it's like, I am eating nothing ramen. but ramen for every meal. I can't fucking, I can't handle this. He can and will handle it. I, Alice, oh. cannot handle this. All of these main characters hold a special place in my heart now. I can get happy or emotionally torn up just thinking back on moments and interactions from the game. Much like in Layton, I was ravenous for every single new line of dialogue and interaction. Pretty much all of the writing was great. Oh, and it's also nice that almost every character, except for Maya, who's 17, is an adult, including the protagonist. Phoenix is 24. The media from Japan that I'm most familiar with, anime, tends to focus on high school age characters. It's nice to see something that ostensibly has an anime style and occupies the same kind of space, focusing primarily on adults. I very much appreciate it and wish it was more common. Variety in storytelling is good, and generally speaking, not having every single character's life being majorly occupied by school can provide a lot of variety. I also enjoyed most of the side characters. The majority of them are quirky, cute, or otherwise memorable. A lot of them are kind of weirdos, but it's usually in an endearing or clever way. It makes the world of Ace Attorney stand out as unique and memorable. And considering the fact that talking to these characters, both through investigations and cross-examinations, is such a large part of the game, game, those characters being engaging and interesting goes a long way towards making the game itself engaging and interesting. There are a lot of puns and wordplay in their names. Very often you can figure out a good chunk of a character's deal from just their name. Will Powers is an action star, Old Bag is an old lady, Lotta Heart, predictably, has a lot of heart. As absolutely on the nose and eye roll inducing as the puns can be, I did wind up finding it charming and cute most of the time. While most characters do have a core comedic gimmick to who they are, they do also tend to have complexity and nuance that you learn about as you interact with them. For example, Will Powers is the star of a children's action series. In the show, he acts in a full body suit, but out of the suit, kids are scared of him because he kinda looks like a monstrous werewolf man. There's a surface level joke there, sure, but the game is willing to treat this problem of his in a serious way as well, which informs his actions and the interactions you have with the character. Will is one of my favorite supporting characters, but most characters have some degree of complexity like that 
if you dig enough. There was, unfortunately, a minor character that I had a negative experience with. Salmonella just made me uncomfortable to be around, primarily because he drools at the mere mention of women and exhibits the traits of a stereotypical hyper-obsessed nerd while spewing outdated, for-the-time meme speak. His jokes aren't funny and his mannerisms are gross. Thankfully, he's a relatively small part of the game, and he is named after an infection, which leads me to believe that, at the very least, the localization team, if not the original writers, think he's filth, but I just kind of wish that he didn't exist. Also, some of the humor is childish. Most of this just made me roll my eyes or internally groan, which I found to be charming in a way, but a very small amount of it I found to be crass enough that it slipped from charming into grading. This is a series that will make complex jokes about high literature, but also occasionally make jokes about someone having the last name Butts. Nothing in the first game stands out in my memory as particularly awful enough to have largely impacted the experience, aside from Sal of Manila fame, of course. It is impressive how skillfully Ace Attorney juggles the strange, often outright zany world brimming with puns, wisecracks, and humorous moments with genuinely moving or tense ones. It knows when to put the comedy aside so serious story beats can happen, and there are multiple moments where a comedic aspect is turned into something more wholesome or serious. Obviously, Obviously, I can't talk about details on that without delving into spoiler territory, but it feels fitting and allows the seemingly disparate aspects of the tone to complement rather than hurt each other. I will say that the game isn't particularly pick up and play. In a micro sense, it totally is. You can walk away for a few hours or even days, likely without running into too many issues. It's a your mileage may vary kind of thing, but the game asks you to remember small details. And a core aspect of the gameplay is pointing out contradictions between what someone says and what the evidence says. Yes, the court record can remind you of a great deal, but it doesn't cover everything. Sometimes very small details can matter a lot, and you might not remember those details if you take a month off in the middle of a case. Fair warning. The localization of Ace Attorney is a surprisingly complex topic. Localization and translation are not always the same thing, and anytime there's any change to the source material during a localization, this tends to cause controversy and cries of censorship. I think in many cases this reaction can be overblown, but personally I evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. Just as an FYI, before we delve into this, I'm white and live in the United States. The setting has changed from a city in Japan to seemingly a city in California that in a later entry is apparently directly stated to be Los Angeles. Some things are tweaked or changed to fit this difference in setting, most things are only changed for practical reasons of playability, but there are some oddities and issues that arise from this decision. As I mentioned, the series criticizes the fucked up Japanese legal system by way of parody. It strikes me as an effective criticism of that legal system, and many of those criticisms could also also be applied to the American legal system, but it's nowhere near as effective in that specific respect, which, hey, fair enough. It wouldn't be a direct criticism of the US legal system without massive changes to the content and context of the story, and I wouldn't ask for nor be happy with that. In a similar vein, there's the discussion of the police. I'm not particularly educated on the problems with police in Japan. Honestly, I'm only marginally more educated on the problems with the legal system, and all of my knowledge of both is secondhand. From some research, there are clearly issues with the police, primarily dealing with corruption, but those issues would obviously differ in some ways from the policing issues that I'm far more familiar with in the US, especially in regards to race. Black Lives Matter. The series does have heroic police characters like Gumshoe, and many police officers are presented as people just trying to do the right thing, but it's also absolutely willing to delve into topics like police corruption and abuse of power. I was initially worried that it would come off as glorifying the police, but by my approximation between incompetence and corruption, the original trilogy definitely does not. But like with the criticism of the legal system, while the criticism of the police has some cultural overlap, it is far more applicable to Japan than to the States. Now, before I actually played the game, I was strictly against the idea of something like changing the setting in a localization. Listen, discovering what 4K 
kids did to Yu-Gi-Oh gave me trust issues with these sort of things, but in the case of Ace Attorney, the gameplay kind of needs you to understand cultural references to logic things out and realize when a contradiction takes place. Leaving all of the cultural touchstones completely unchanged would make the games pretty impenetrable to a casual Western audience without a lot of added in explanations that would likely make the game seem very handholdy. Having actually played the games, I can see why this decision was made and do hesitantly agree with it. The vast, vast majority of the actual content and writing is the same, but anything that seems culturally out of place will either be discussed as if it's weird or have some sort of logical justification for its existence in this place, possibly with an accompanying explanation, or it'll be changed in some way so the average Western player isn't going to be stumped by minutia. Time zones, overseas travel times, what someone from the country talks like in Japan as opposed to in the US, stuff like that. It's far from a perfect solution. I do sometimes roll my eyes or laugh at things that were unnecessarily changed or clearly out of place, like Maya liking burgers instead of noodles, or some old man yelling about the good old days, but very clearly talking about the old days of Japan. And while a character like Lada was a Japanese woman speaking with a Kansai dialect in the original, her speaking with a Southern accent and claiming to be from the heartland probably probably makes most Western players assume she's white. I don't know if I should call this whitewashing, but the subject of her race also doesn't really get talked about anywhere in the text. It's probably the messiest part of the localization choice. All of the names are changed, which makes sense. Puns and wordplay don't translate between languages particularly well. Most of the cast are assumed to be US citizens. The Fey family definitely has clearly evident Japanese roots in their design. And in general, I read the main characters, the Fey's, Phoenix, and Edgeworth, as being Japanese Americans, but with so many localization changes that becomes more difficult to apply in a blanket way to the entire cast of supporting characters in a way that makes logical sense. Like with Lada, I don't know if that character is now meant to be a Japanese American woman with those traits, or if this localized version of her is now meant to be white. Current Capcom localization for the series seems to take place in Japan, which at least alleviates some of the whitewashing concerns. Japanese people making this creative decision is very different from white Americans making this decision, but I'm not 100% sure how Capcom handled localizations for the series during the time of the first game, and that makes drawing concrete conclusions about these creative decisions difficult for me. The whitewashing of characters is bad, but this really doesn't feel like it fits neatly into that box. It's a complex situation. That said, even if this isn't whitewashing, then it's close enough to it to make me uncomfortable. It's messy, and I just don't feel great about this particular aspect of the localization. Adding further to the complication, most mentions of Europe in the localization were actually referring to the United States in the original. All in all, it's a change that I understand the reason behind, and we might not have gotten these games localized at all without these changes, or it might not have sold well enough in the West to continue getting localizations. It's just far from an entirely perfect solution. But there are some upsides to it, like the game's never going to ask you to read kanji to solve a puzzle, which would have been a very difficult ask for a primarily English-speaking audience. And there are some very Japanese things that don't get shied away from at all. The secondary protagonist is a spirit medium, there's a case focused on a tokusatsu hero, and later games have you going to some very Japanese locations. And that winds up giving the localized version of the series a rather unique Japanese American feel that I found myself enjoying more and more as I progressed through the games. At times it even seems kind of self-aware about the whole situation, and I respect its willingness to embrace the oddity with a wink and a nod. I just wish that those messier aspects of the localization were in some way addressed, either in game or in some official statement of some kind. The music is much easier to talk about. It's absolutely killer the entire way through. Every single track is on its own amazing, and when taken as a whole, they perfectly capture the tone and tension of every single scene. 
Arguments with Edgeworth just wouldn't be the same without that objection track kicking in as Phoenix goes fucking off. There are a lot of tracks that are tied to starting at a specific line, and often the music will dramatically cut out for a moment, only to come back with a track that's even more intense. It's absolutely exhilarating every single time. I grew up on Game Boy Advance games. It was the first system I owned. GBA chiptoon soundscapes just kind of grab me immediately. It's deeply ingrained nostalgia. This is especially true for Ace Attorney because the game just sounds like Battle Network to me. Like it makes sense that there might be an overlap in the sound banks used for the games. They're both GBA games made by Capcom at a similar time, but it's so uncanny to feel such a specific kind of nostalgia for something that I've never actually played before. I like the sound design in addition to the music is what I'm saying. In case you didn't know, I'm trans and a lesbian. I feel like I've been saying that a lot in recent videos and I just never get tired of saying it. How crazy. Of course, I'm mentioning this because I want to talk about how this game handles queer content. And I want you to know what lens I'm viewing that from in case you're not familiar with me. Though, who knows, I might just randomly say that in the middle of other videos because I can and it's fun. To get the obvious question out of the way, yes, I ship Phoenix and Edgeworth for a multitude of reasons, the blue and red, the whole rivals to lovers thing being a very appealing trope, the matching rings that were themed after the characters, and the Nintendo Power article among them, but many of the more important reasons are spoilers. There's a very specific line I can point to that got me absolutely on board with the ship, but I'll talk about this in a bit more detail in my next Ace Attorney video. I mean, really, how can you read Edgeworth as not having feelings for Phoenix? Also, there's no way that man is straight. Look at him! Shipping aside, there are no explicitly queer characters in this game, or at least none that are actively in relationships. But as a queer person, the game actually felt very welcoming in a way that most other media doesn't. This was for two reasons. For one, whenever LGBT plus subjects came up, it didn't seem like they were being mocked. There's a joke where Phoenix says that two guys must be lovers, and it's only a ridiculous joke because of who they are and that Phoenix would come to that conclusion based on the evidence, not because of the fact that they're both guys. It never struck me as mean-spirited in this respect. And characters do occasionally flirt with or express desire for characters of the same gender, especially in the second and third games. Even without more explicit representation, just the acknowledgement that queer people exist and that existence not being treated as a joke is a big deal to me. Two, in most media, the personal character arc aspect of the narrative relies heavily on heterosexual romance in some capacity. In many cases, it's treated as the most important secondary plot of any given narrative. In most movies, the male and female lead will kiss at the end. Regardless of chemistry, characters will often be arbitrarily paired off with opposite gender partners in epilogues. Longer series tend to have het love triangles or long-term will they, won't they back and forths that almost always end in yes, of course they will. Everyone always knew that they would. I could complain about this for hours. The quality of these storylines can vary wildly, but that's not the point. The point is that it's so common that it's fucking everywhere. A heterosexual relationship is the assumed happy ending in so, so many things. And that just does very little for me. 
An ace attorney heterosexual relationships don't feel like the major focus, goal, or end point of character arcs, especially those of the main characters. Like, yes, heterosexual relationships do exist, but the vast majority of them are established before the game begins or have to do with Larry. The biggest example of this is the fact that Phoenix and Maya do not have a romantic relationship. Like I said, they act like siblings and the narrative treats their relationship as platonic. This lets queer character interpretations exist very easily and freely, and that combined with the non-hostile acknowledgement of the existence of people like me, makes the franchise feel welcoming to who I am, even without a focus on queer content. I didn't really realize how rare that feeling was, nor how much I valued it until I felt it here. Obviously, I'd prefer more explicit representation, but this was a Japanese game released in 2001. The fact that there's this much subtext and I got this sort of feeling from it, I'm just gonna count that as a win and enjoy it. Especially because the queer interpretations of characters do get at least acknowledged by secondary and promotional material, and explicit representation does come in the more recent games in the franchise. Franchise. The third case of the game, format-wise, is more of the same, but in terms of content, it's a case focused around a murder that takes place on a tokusatsu show set. Think something like Kamen Rider, which is a really cool concept, and it does clever things with it. It's very, very rare to see acknowledgement of tokusatsu stuff outside of tokusatsu works or things heavily inspired by them like Mega Man. I love it, and it's delightfully more than just a surface level reference. I think the people at Capcom might like tokusatsu, at least a little bit. Also, this is an example of the series not shying away from its Japanese roots, even with the localization changes, which is cool. While I do love everything having to do with this case, well, almost everything, I've gotta say, the Steel Samurai, the tokusatsu hero from this case, not super fond of the design. I think it looks kinda lame. Still a delightful case, though. Where can I get? You're gonna get shouted at by the Ace Attorney fandom. Oh well. Pink Princess for life. I do want to talk about the concept of a filler case in Ace Attorney. This is basically any case that doesn't directly address or focus on the main characters of the franchise. Stuff having to do with the Faze or Phoenix or Edgeworth's backstories or direct development, generally speaking. Case three is the only filler case in this game. I hate the terminology. Maybe I just have a negative association with it due to old shonen action series, but I don't like the implication that it exists just to fill time. There's valuable content here. For one, the case itself is interesting, and I found it very engaging to unravel the mystery, but also it gives more room for characterization for Phoenix, Maya, and Edgeworth, which is important. Getting more Edgeworth is especially important for the story of this game in particular. Getting a whole other case of interacting with him adds value and impact to everything having to do with that both in this game and in the original trilogy as a whole. And without this case, there would only be one case where Maya was in the role of assistant, which would be a bit odd? Basically, I'm very against the idea of these cases somehow being lesser than those that have more of a focus on things relevant to the main characters. They have their place and serve an important function in the overall narrative. I'm especially against the idea of cutting any of them. Thankfully, this game doesn't have any bad cases, but if any game were to have a particularly awful case, then I'd argue that it should be improved rather than removed. But I'm sure that's something that I won't have to talk about anytime soon. Right? The fourth case was originally the final case of the game. It's a wonderful wrap up to the story. I love it to bits and I can't really talk about it at all because everything about it is crazy spoilers. I'll just say that it has what's my favorite individual moment in the game and it does a lot to vary up the conventions that are established in the first three cases. It's fucking great. This game is very worth finishing. There is also a fifth case, Rise from the Ashes, that was added for the collection. It was developed while the fourth Ace Attorney game was being worked on, and it apparently lays the groundwork for some aspects of the fourth game on, but it primarily functions as a very extended epilogue for the first game, as well as a celebration of the original trilogy. I didn't really recognize them at the time, but there are a lot of small references and Easter eggs to things from the second and third games sprinkled throughout the case. I weirdly wound up getting the 
these references in the reverse, which was still an enjoyable process, just a bit odd looking back on it. You unlock the case after finishing the fourth one, just make sure you let the credits roll. Because it's an epilogue case, it has a lot of spoilers for the first game. I'm gonna have to be vague and not delve into details at all. That said, it touches on a lot of main character stuff, especially fleshing out aspects related to Mia's life outside of all of the Faye stuff, which I found myself very excited to learn about. And there was also very tangible evidence of character development, as any good epilogue should have. There are also quite a few new characters, all of whom I love, but I especially love Emma, who is adorably earnest and serves the role of Phoenix's assistant in this case. The energy of traveling around with her, engaging in scientific investigation is rather different from traveling around with Maya. It's cute and it's fun. Okay, so Rise from the Ashes is long. Really fucking long. Like longer than any other case in the original trilogy. If I had to take a stab in the dark, I'd say it's like two to two and a half cases worth of courtroom drama. I am very much down for this amount of content, but I'll admit that it was a bit daunting. Especially compared to the pacing of the cases in the first game, there was a lot of information to process and the difficulty of the case is on par with, if not more difficult than, the hardest cases in the original trilogy. It was hard to not feel a bit overwhelmed, but again, I very much enjoyed it. I'm not sure if this is like a controversial opinion, but I do recommend playing it right after finishing the first game for story reasons. It provides a lot of information, character development, and context that I feel adds to the emotional impact of important events in the second and third games. The collection places this at the end of the first game for this reason, I second that placement, and just consider it as the fifth and final case of the first game. That said, it is nice that there's a substantial amount of content here for people who had already played the original trilogy. It's definitely worth playing either way. From a technical perspective, since Rise from the Ashes was made for a game with this new art style and that wasn't limited to what could fit on a GBA cartridge, it can take better advantage of that art style. Basically, there are more elaborate and frequent animations and the backgrounds all have a lot of detail. Are you gonna show Meekins? Fucking freaking. There's a lot. There's there's Meekins. There's the clap. There's the fucking bento box presentation. Like, there's fucking Marshall with his knife, like shaving his. Fi like, there's a lot, and everybody gets them like all the time. There are some gameplay additions as well to go along with that whole scientific investigation thing. The two biggest additions are probably the fact that you can now examine a 3D model of each piece of evidence, turn it around, interact with it, and examine different parts of it to gain new information and clues. This is a super cool addition that feels like a very natural extension of the formula. You can also look for fingerprints at crime scenes and match those fingerprints to a database of people involved with the case. This adds another wrinkle to the investigation aspect of the case and it made it feel like working with Emma actually had a tangible impact on the gameplay. It made sense and it was fun. There are also some one-off mechanics that leave a bit to be desired. There's a bit where you reconstruct a broken vase. It's just kind of repetitive. It doesn't take too long, but it just felt very lackluster. There's also a court bit where you have to point things out in video footage, which is an absolutely excellent idea. It's like a more... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's guess yeah, what. Yeah. Please look forward to Ace of Dirty Four. It's it's a good idea, right? It's such a good idea. It's such a good idea. <sighs> hey Alice. Oh no. All you all you it, need I'm i I'm just gonna warn you. It's bad. It's worse. All you need is a fast forward and rewind. Like, like, there are more convenience features you could add, but, like, all you need is a fast forward and rewind. It's worse, Alice. <sighs> great. It's like a more extreme version of pointing something out on a picture, and the video footage for this section captures why it could be so cool perfectly. It's from a camera that was on a swivel, and there's something in the footage that's purposefully very distracting and thus hard to look away from. It's a unique challenge that makes perfect sense in the context of the courtroom, but it's just too fucking inconvenient to really be fun. You don't have a fast forward or rewind, you just have to watch all the footage play out 
slowly every single time you want to look at it. With more control over the playback of the footage, it would be an excellent part of the game, but as it stands, it was just a neat idea that needed a bit more work. But all in all, the vast majority of the gameplay is just highly refined Ace Attorney goodness. And I'm already at the point where I can't get enough of that, so I am very, very glad that this case exists. Honestly, I'm torn between this and the fourth case being my favorite from this first game, and they're honestly both contenders for my favorite case in the original trilogy as well. Lawyer game good. From afar, I had always thought that Ace Attorney looked like a fun, unique experience. I thought I'd enjoy the games, but I never expected to absolutely fall in love with the series and its characters so quickly. Like, I even love the judge as a character, and we don't even learn his name. I'll be real, if I wasn't working on these videos and wanted to make sure to keep my thoughts somewhat orderly on the franchise for the sake of evaluating and gushing about each game, I probably would have already caught up on the whole franchise. If you've never tried the games, hopefully I've presented enough evidence to prove they're worth your time. This has been Callous Constant Internal Panic Brunel. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed me rambling about the lawyer game for probably about an hour, liking the video really does help more people see it because of magical YouTube math. And why don't you pop down to the comments and let me know what your favorite line in the game is. Or just like, let me know how your day's been. Mine's been all right, thanks for asking. My Patreon exists if you'd like to support me. There's neat bonuses like access to my Discord server where memes get posted and we complain about the evils of capitalism so feel free to go look at that. Speaking of, big thanks to all of my current patrons like Lada, Edith, and Sam, all of whom are really cool people. Keep loving what you love, and I'll see you next time with something else. Because I can't not be paranoid about everything all the time, I still have at least seven of these games to play and I'm already worried about the future of the franchise. I can already tell that I'm always going to want more. The great Ace Attorney localizations are a good sign at least.